is Friday, October 18th, 2019. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. It's a very exhausting, get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu today, um, or Friday today. <laughs> I mean, that's that's about how hard I got my ass kicked. I forgot what day it was. Um, but yeah, we were doing takedowns. That was the, the name of the game. That was all that was on the menu. It was takedowns, takedowns, takedowns into the night. And uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Very exhausting, though. I'll tell you. It, it just leads me to believe that I need to spend about, oh, I don't know, uh, an hour a week doing that for... I don't know, until I die at least, until I can finally get that one straight. Jeez. Uh, but yeah, we did a little bit of sparring on the feet, um, just to the takedown and then back up again. Um, but yeah, mostly it was just takedowns, um, I think, from what I remember. I don't know, I've been having a little bit of trouble with that lately. It's just been so busy doing other shit lately. Hmm. I mean, it, it is a busy time of year for certain among us <laughs> uh, that have to do certain things during this time of year. It is harvest time. And so uh, those of us who are lucky enough to grow a plant or two uh, are buried under shit to t- fucking trim and treat and all that other shit. And, and uh, it's exhausting, man. I, I'll tell you what. I, I, I've been doing it for... Gosh, how many years? Seems to me I was doing it before 2010. And then I did a little bit... I, I worked for somebody else for a short period of time, and then I went back to doing it again. Um, but yeah, planting. It's, uh, it's very fun. It's very rewarding. It's very exhausting work. And it is intensive. You know, I've said it before on the show here that... Uh, you know, anybody who thinks that it's just as simple as putting a seed in the ground, watering it, and, and then harvesting it. I'm sorry, kids. That There's far more to it than that. There's bugs. There's mold. There's weather. There's shit. There's your, your greenhouse is falling, falling, in, falling in under the fucking snow. It's, it's hailing outside. You know, it's just... It's always something. You know, you... you it, it's it, it's a never-ending battle. And as soon as you put the seed in the ground, it's a it's a race between you and the bugs. Which one's going to get it first, or which one? Uh, you and nature. Which one is going to get it first? Um, but this year, I managed to make it out kind of lucky, from what I understand. I mean, pretty much everybody I've talked to said said that they they suffered major issues with mold, and um, that was one thing I was kind of spared this year. Um, but I, I, I don't think it was because the mold wasn't trying to get to it. I think it was because I was on top of it. You know, if I saw a spot of mold, I cut that shit out immediately. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, if you, if you're seeing mold on your buds, chances are there's mold pretty much all throughout your plant and you just don't know it. And, uh, a lot of people let it go. You know, they, they see the one spot and they're like, eh, no, that's just one spot of mold. You know, they're not counting on the fact that there's an entire branch that's infected there, and they're just seeing the one little spot that's, you know, plain and obvious, and that the rest of the plant is rotting out from under it, you know? And so, uh, yeah, like I said, I just, I tried to stay really on top of it this year. If I saw any mold, I immediately cut that shit out. Didn't even, didn't even have a, a second thought about it, really. You know, it's like I, I had this one really, really big cola. Looked wonderful, but then the uh, the tip of it was a little reddish, and I started looking around it, and I found another spot of mold, and it turned out the whole fucking thing was just hollow. It was full of mold, and so it was not very, not a very happy moment because, you know, it was a quite impressive cola, but nonetheless, I cut that shit right out, you know. There's no reason to lose the rest of your crop over one bud, you know? But yeah, so jujitsu. Um, I'm trying to remember all of the stuff we went over today. We did a, a, um, a variation on the guillotine choke. 
And I got somebody in a guillotine choke the other day. I mean, I I never get the right angle for a guillotine choke, and I'm I'm, I'm over at a uh, another person's gym uh, training with them, and I I managed to get this guy in a guillotine choke first thing. So it's like, okay, you know, maybe this is a useful pr- piece of my arsenal that I just I'm I haven't trained it enough yet, you know. <laughs> But anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. And as far as where we're going to go, I actually thought about this one a little bit before I even got here. Because it's kind of a pain to try and think of it up right at the last minute. So here it is. Ski Mask Way. First Dance. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Melvin's with Revolve. So as far as where we're going to go today, and a couple things here, got the uh, G7 Working Group on Stable Coins report. It's about 37 pages long. I think we can chew through that, um, and that may be where we end up. Um, let's see. There was something else I wanted to mention on here. No, that's not it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where we're going to go with it because... Oh, yeah, this was the other thing. All right. I, I knew that if I kept looking for the tab that I would find it. Um, but anyway, uh, we go on a lot about uh, about privacy coins on this, on this show because I, I really believe that in the not-so-distant future, the proposition of privacy coins will be challenged. Uh, they'll, they'll be necessitated... And the the proposition of them will be challenged, you know, whether or not they're actually as private as they claim. Anyway, so I got this thing here. It's on uh, Forbes.com. A serious dark web warning issued after Tor browser users have Bitcoin stolen. This is by uh, Billy Bambro. Uh, Let's see. uh, So, yes, penis. And... uh, Let's see, it was authored October 18th, 2019 at 5.30 a.m. No indication of time zone. Shame on you, Billy. Continuing on. Bitcoin and other major cryptocurrencies have become a favorite target of hackers and scammers in recent years, spurred by the Bitcoin price explosion. The Bitcoin price, up twofold since the beginning of the year, has fallen back somewhat recently, though not enough to put off cyber criminals. Now researchers are warning are warning a are warning a version of the widely used privacy-focused Tor browser has been used to spy on users and steal their Bitcoin. The total amount of confirmed stolen funds has been put at 4.8 Bitcoin, worth almost $40,000 at current prices, though experts from cybersecurity company ESET have cautioned the real amount could be far higher, with the campaign running unnoticed for many years. Quote, This malware lets the criminals behind this campaign see what website the victim is currently using. In theory, they can change the content of the visited page, grab the data the victim fills in to forms, and display fake messages, among other activities. However, we have seen only one particular functionality, changing the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency wallets, said Anton Chirapanov, ESET senior malware researcher. The Trojanized version of the Tor browser, which is most often used to access the so-called dark web, where people can buy illicit goods and services in exchange for Bitcoin, has targeted Russian-speaking users of the anonymous Tor network and is disguised as as the official browser, with Cherepanov warning, quote, Non-technically savvy people probably won't notice any difference between the original version and the trojanized one. ESET researchers found the malware is targeting three of the largest Russian-speaking dark web markets, alert, al- altering the details of popular Russian, Russian money transfer service Kiwi, 
or Bitcoin wallets located on pages from these markets. When a user visits their profile page in order to add Bitcoin to their dark web market, the compromised Tor browser swaps the original Bitcoin address with one controlled by criminals. Quote, During our investigation, we identified three Bitcoin wallets that have been used in this campaign since 2017. Each, wallet, each such wallet contains relatively large numbers of small transactions. We consider this a confirmation that these wallets indeed were used by the Trojanized Tor browser, said Cherpanov. <clears throat> it should be noted that the real amount of stolen money is higher because the Trojanized Tor browser also alters Kiwi wallets. As Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have become more widely used and their value has climbed, Bitcoin scams and cyber attacks have increased. Earlier this week, researchers warned of a strain of malware designed to extort victims called Save Yourself that could potentially compromise Bitcoin wallets. Yeah, so definitely watch out for your own bunghole. Meanwhile, the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency industry was dealt a blow earlier this week when it was revealed pedophiles around the world had been swapping images of child abuse for Bitcoin on the dark web in one of the largest child pornography busts ever. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good score on us. Bitcoin was used to nail child porn dealers. I mean, come on now. You know, if we're going to get the blame for people using the shit, we should be get, getting the credit for when they're using Bitcoin leads to them getting caught. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be the just way to go about it, right? Anywho, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get into this uh, this report here, if I can find it, now that I've ditched it to find other shit. Oh, none. No, that's not it. There we go. And uh, this is the G7 Working Group on Stablecoins uh, investigating the impact of global stablecoins. And uh, let's see here. I got to make a minor adjustment before we get into this thing. If I can find something here. Oh, let's see. I know I got it around here somewhere. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> Investigating the impact of global stable coins. Like, that's actually really a thing to worry about, right? Of all things to worry about. Let's see, that's the summary. Here we go. Investigating the impact of global stablecoins, a report by the G7 Working Group on stablecoins. Executive summary. Technological innovation is transforming the provision of financial services and products. Payment services in particular have seen significant change in recent years through the introduction of new payment methods platforms, and interfaces. In fact, an increasing number of countries have payment systems that provide inexpensive and near-instant domestic payments. However, challenges in current payment services remain. Above all, cross-border payments remain slow, expensive, and opaque, especially for retail payments, such as remittances. Moreover, there are 1.7 billion people globally who are unbanked or underserved with respect to financial services. Given the innovative potential of the underlying technology, crypto assets were originally envisioned to address some of these challenges. However, to date, they have suffered from a number of limitations, not least severe price volatility. Thus, crypto assets have served as a highly speculative asset class for certain investors and 
those engaged in illicit activities rather than as a means to make payments. Stable coins have many of the features of crypto assets but seek to stabilize the price of the coin by linking its value to that of a pool of assets. Therefore, stablecoins might be more capable of serving as a means of payment and a store of value and they could potentially contribute to the development of global payment arrangements that are faster, cheaper and more inclusive than present arrangements. That said, stablecoins are just one of the many initiatives that seek to address existing challenges in the payment system and being a nascent technology they are largely untested. Yet these potential benefits could only be realized if significant risks are addressed. Stable coins regardless of size pose legal, regulatory and oversight challenges and risks related to number one legal certainty. Number two sound governance including the investment the investment rules of the stability mechanism number three money laundering terrorist financing and other forms of illicit finance four safety efficiency and integrity of payment systems five cybersecurity and operational resilience six market integrity seven Data privacy, protection, and portability. 8. Consumer slash investor protection. 9. Tax compliance. Moreover, stablecoins that reach global scale could pose challenges and risks to quote, monetar- oh, I'm sorry, number one, monetary policy. Number two, financial stability. Number three, the international monetary system. And number four, fair competition. <clears throat> uh, I think these guys are worried about the wrong thing. The fact that we do have fair competition with fiat currencies is the only reason they're even talking about us. Private sector entities that design stablecoin arrangements are expected to address a wide array of legal, regulatory and oversight challenges and risks. In particular, such arrangements will need to adhere to necessary standards and requirements and comply with the relevant laws and regulations of the various jurisdictions in which they will operate. This will also need to incorporate sound governance and appropriate end-to-end -end risk management practices to address, to address risks before they materialize. The G7 believes that no global stablecoin project should begin operation until the legal, regulatory and oversight challenges and risks outlined above are adequately addressed though appropriate, uh, through appropriate designs and by adhering to regulation that is clear and proportionate to the risks. That said, Depending on the unique design and details of each stablecoin arrangement, approval may be contingent on additional regulatory requirements and adherence to core public policy goals. Um, you know, the, um, the public policy goals with regard to cryptocurrencies are to completely disregard the G7, the IMF, the Federal Reserve, the central banking system, yeah. Anyway, continuing. Some risks are amplified and new risks might arise if adoption is global in nature. <clears throat> Stablecoin initiatives built on existing large and or cross-border customer base have the potential to scale rapidly to achieve global or other substantial footprint they already have. These are referred to as global stablecoins. Oh gosh, they even got a fucking a specific designation. You know what? It's too fucking late. A stablecoin at least is defined by the terms of like, say, um, in terms of, um, say, Tether. You know, th this is a... 
the transactions for for Tether are more or less performed on a on a side chain off of Bitcoin and or Ethereum, depending on which way you want to go. But the point being is you need global decentralized public blockchains in order to have stable coins, global or otherwise. Continuing on. Some risks are amplified and new risks might arise if, if adoption is global in nature. Stablecoin initiatives built on existing large and or cross-border. Yeah, we already got that. These are referred to as global stablecoins. GSCs. GSCs could have significant adverse effects both domestically and internationally on the transmission of monetary policy as well as financial stability in addition to cross-jurisdictional efforts to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. They could also have implications for the international monetary system more generally, including currency substitution, and could therefore pose challenges to monetary sovereignty. God damn, these people are living in like 2007 or some shit. GSCs also raise concerns around fair competition and antitrust policy, including in relation to payments data. These risks, which are of a systemic nature, merit careful monitoring and further study. Both benefits and risks of GSC may affect some countries more significantly than others, depending on the state of development of their existing financial and payment systems, the stability of their currencies, and their level of financial inclusion, among other factors. <clears throat> For stablecoin developers, a sound, a sound legal basis in all relevant jurisdictions in particular, legal chair, uh, clarity on the on the nature of the claim to all participants in the stablecoin ecosystem, such as coin holders and issuers, is an absolute prerequisite. No, it isn't. You don't even give a fuck about Circle. You don't give a fuck about them counterfeiting one billion dollars. You haven't paid any attention to them. Why the fuck do you give a fuck now? Anyway, continuing on. Ambiguous rights and obligations could make the stablecoin arrangement vulnerable to loss of confidence an unacceptable risk. Yeah, too fucking bad. That's not up to you to fucking to define, assholes. Especially in a payment system of potentially global importance. Yeah, that's for us to decide. This, that's for the, the globe to decide whether or not they want to engage in it. Not you. Ambiguous rights. Uh, we got that. Whether value stabilization relies on market mechanisms such as the existence of an active network of resellers or a commitment by the issuer to redeem at a given price, it should be demonstrated that such arrangements will achieve their exact ex their objectives at all times and for all customers. The governance structure of the arrangement as well as the investment rules of the stability mechanism must also be fully specified and understood by participants hold on right there you know what there isn't a single fiat currency that can meet that standard on this planet period there isn't a single fiat currency issued by a single government or a single central bank that that can meet that criteria not a single fucking one Continuing on, public authorities must coordinate across agencies, sectors, and jurisdictions to support responsible innovation in payments while ensuring a globally consistent response to mitigating risks. To that end, some international organizations and standard-setting bodies have already issued guidance, principles, and standards for the supervision and regulation of existing payment arrangements, including crypto assets, which address many of the challenges listed above. This includes the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, CPMI, and International Organization of Securities Commissions, IOSCO, Principles for Financial Market Infrastructures, PFMI, 
for systemically important payments arrangements, as well as the recently strengthened financial action, t the FATF, recommendations for AML, CFT, and countering the financing of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction which includes standards relating to virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. Yeah, go suck a dick. You, you, you have no idea what you're talking about or means of executing any kind of control over any of this shit. Capital markets and banking regulations and standards may also apply to various aspects of the stablecoin arrangement. International organizations and standard-setting bodies should continue to assess the adequacy of their current frameworks to address any new issues and challenges that stablecoins stable, stable could present. Yeah, it's already so too late for that shit. Moreover, authorities and individual jurisdictions should aim for their regulations to adhere to these principles and standards and apply these regulations to stablecoin arrangements. Public authorities should apply a technology-neutral, functions-based regulatory approach and should be mindful to forestall harmful regulatory arbitrage and to ensure a level playing field that encourages competition. Okay, you know what? The best way to 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 achieve that is to just shut the fuck up and leave us alone. That that's that's how you achieve what you just st said right there. Right? Continuing on. Stable coins may combine novel and untested technology and new entrants to financial services and could thus pose risk that fall outside of existing frameworks. This may also include new, ri new risks, which should be addressed by requiring compliance to the highest regulatory standards, potentially revising existing standards, or creating new standards and regulations where needed, and after a thorough assessment of potential regulatory gaps. The Financial S Stability Board, FSB, and these standard-setting bodies are intensifying their efforts to assess how their existing principles and standards could be applied to stablecoins and or developing new policy recommendations for stablecoin arrangements in a globally consistent and coordinated manner. In this regard, the G7 Working Group welcomes the FSB's plans to assess, in cooperation with standard-setting bodies, what key regulatory issues exist around global stablecoins and to submit a consultative report to the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in April of 2020 in a final report in July of 2020. Finally, it should be stressed that the advent of private sector innovations to payment arrangements does not mean that public authorities will cease their efforts to improve the current system. Finance ministries, central banks, standard-setting bodies such as the CPMI, and the relevant international organizations should continue their efforts to promote faster, more reliable, and less costly payment systems for both domestic and cross-border purposes, using new technology where appropriate and in a globally consistent and coordinated manner. In particular, the public sector should redouble its effort to support measures to improve financial inclusion. You know, it, cryptocurrencies weren't necessarily created to bank the unbanked, per se. They were created to give us <clears throat> created to give us an option in a realm where we did not have options see before all we had was your way or the highway and when i'm saying your way i'm talking to like the the imf the fat f those guys it, it was your way or the highway either we dealt with in your monetary units and according to your monetary conditions and your taxation regulations and all that other bullshit or we could not transact well bitcoin changed all that 
Bitcoin introduced the possibility for us to say, well, you know what? I don't really like the conditions you're offering here. I don't really like things like excise tax and sales tax and payment tax and all other kinds of taxes that you want to apply to my average everyday retail transactions. And so I want to simply disregard them. I want to use a medium that does not charge me these things. That is not incorporated into the state and federal government. And is not made specifically to track me like a rat. Although it does track my transactions, cryptocurrencies do not necessarily give a fuck who I am. And do not necessarily take any kind of track of who I am, where I am, what I'm spending my money on. These are none of your business. And because we do have the option to do so, we probably will. Especially as using the regulated coin of the day, be it US dollar or other fiat currency will become will simply become too costly to transact period you know that it'll lose enough of its face value and there will be enough regulatory friction and cruft on every single action that you try to do i mean like really you want an idea of what i'm talking about look at your fucking phone bill sometime and you see all those little taxes and excise this and tax that bullshit that that's applied on there None of that needs to exist. And as a matter of fact, very, very little of it does anything to improve your service. So, in contrast to that, if you were to, say, pay a small payment in cryptocurrency, where you your service provider said to you, okay, it's time for the bill, $19, we'll take it in whatever, whatever payment medium you want to use, Okay, I'll pay you in Dogecoin. Is that all right? Sure thing, no problem. $19 worth of Dogecoin later, I've got another month of service. It was an entirely consensual uh, transaction. It was just between me and one other person. Did not include a state or other regulatory entity. As such entities don't really do anything to improve my service. And there's this, there's this, like FUD method, where they they suggest that their their participation as regulators actually does something to make things better for you, and this is not true, especially not in finance. You know, I I've watched the maturity of this gov- this space, and there has there's been nothing from government. There has been nothing from institutional finance that has improved cryptocurrency at all. Nothing. I don't really think there are... I I think maybe the expectation to be able to serve the planet as as a payment medium and network... That that might be about the best that we can we can say that we got from Visa or the U.S. government, for that matter. Anyway, continuing on, we encourage central banks, finance ministers, standard-setting bodies such as the CPMI and relevant international organizations to develop roadmaps for improving the efficiency and lowering the cost of payments in financial services. Initial recommendations are outlined in the report. Additionally, central banks will continue to share knowledge of and experience on a variety of possible solutions to improving payment systems. Finally, central banks individually and collectively will assess the relevance of issuing central bank digital currencies in view of the costs and benefits in their representative juris- or their respective jurisdictions. Number 1 Introduction. Payments are in a state of flux, and innovation is extensive. Domestic payments, in most instances, are increasingly convenient, instantaneous, and available 24-7. 
the traditional bank-based ecosystem is being disrupted from below by startups and from above by well-established big techs. When asked in a recent survey about which financial products and services are most likely or are mostly affected by technological developments and competition, banks and tech firms alike ranked payments the highest, both currently and over the next five years. Despite significant improvements in recent years, current payment systems still have two major failings lack of universal access to financial services for a large share of the world's population and inefficient cross-border payment retail payments uh, both of those were taken care of back in 2009 globally 1.7 billion adults do not have access to a transaction account even though 1.1 billion of them have a mobile phone as a transaction account as transaction accounts are gateways to additional financial systems or services such as credit, savings and insurance, the lack of access to such accounts impedes financial inclusion. The first wave of crypto assets of which Bitcoin is the best known have so far failed to provide a reliable and attractive means of payment or store of value. That's bullshit. <clears throat> They have suffered from highly volatile prices, limits to scalability, complicated user interfaces, and issues in government governance and regulation, among other challenges. No, they haven't. Thus, crypto assets have served more as a highly speculative asset class for certain investors and those engaged in illicit activities, rather than as a means to make payments. No, this is complete bullshit. Number one, if they if they weren't usable to make payments, they would be completely useless as a means uh, for investing. If you couldn't say if you couldn't store value in it, there wouldn't be any reason to trade it. You know, because sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. You know, it, I I think the the big mistake here is that they're looking at this from the the perspective of something that's supposed to be regulated cryptocurrencies were not designed nor intended to be regulated they were simply meant to be like agnostic with regard to regulation and all that other shit you know they they're not bound to any government they're not bound to any particular culture or religion but they can be you know, you're you're free to design your own Mormon coin and release it, but whether or not any, uh, the Mormons will use it, it's it's beyond me. I have no idea whether they will or not. Only only you can find out. No, the only way you'll find out is by trying. Of course, for it to be worth anything to to anyone, it has to be worth something to someone other than just Mormons. You know, somebody else has to be able to invest in it possibly make money on the arbitrage, maybe even spend it for goods and services. Anyway, continuing on. At present, emerging stable coins have many of the features of more traditional crypto assets. What, what's a fucking more traditional crypto asset? Oh. But seek to stabilize the price of the coin by linking its value to that of an asset or pool of assets. The term stablecoin has no established international classification and such coins may not actually be stable and may pose risks that are similar to those of other crypto assets. They do whether or not you want them to. The report focuses on stablecoins that represent a claim either on a specific issuer or on an underlying, on underlying assets or funds or some other right or interest. These stable coins might be more readily usable as a means of payment and store value and could potentially foster the development of global payments arrangements that are faster, cheaper, and more inclusive than present arrangements. 
Therefore, they may be able to address some of the shortcomings of existing payment systems and deliver greater benefits to users. Actually, they do. The uh, Russian Mafia uses them to uh, launder U.S. dollars, but that's beside the point. Stablecoins could be used by anyone, retail or general purpose, or only by a limited number of actors, i.e. financial institutions or selected clients of financial institutions, wholesale. This report covers issues that apply to all stablecoins, while at times drawing out issues of particular relevance to retail stablecoins. Stablecoin arrangements are part of an ecosystem comprising multiple interdependent entities with different roles, technologies, and governance structures. Appropriate regulation and accountability requires an understanding of the ecosystem as a whole and how its parts interact. Stablecoin arrangements are expected to meet the same criteria and abide by the same requirements as traditional payment, clearing, and settlement systems, that is, the same activities and the same risks should face the same regulations. Hence, stablecoin developers should work to ensure stablecoin ecosystems are appropriately, are appropriately designed and operate safely and efficiently in accordance with public policy. Stablecoins present a host of potential challenges and risks for, for public policy, oversight, and regulation, including legal certainty, sound governance, anti-money laundering, and the countering of finance, financing of terrorism, AML, CFT compliance, operational resilience, including for cybersecurity, consumer investment and data protection, and, and tax compliance. Yeah, fuck you. These risks can be can partially be addressed within existing regulatory, supervisory, and oversight frameworks, but there may be reg regulatory gaps to address or as well. Regulatory and policy frameworks are expected to remain technolo technology neutral and not hinder innovation as long as it does not conflict with public policy goals, including monetary sovereignty. Yeah, if I issue my own cryptocurrency, uh, that that's my own monetary sovereignty. Y you, you don't have any right over it, so fuck off. Recently, a number of stablecoin initiatives have emerged, some of which are sponsored by large technology or financial firms. With their existing large customer base, which additionally may be cross-border, these new stablecoins have the potential to scale rapidly and achieve a global or other substantial footprint. These are referred to as global stablecoins. You know, it's really funny, in all this discussion about um, stablecoins and Facebook coin and Libra and Calibra and all that other bullshit, I'm not hearing anything about Goldman Sachs coin or JP Morgan coin. You know, the stable coins that both JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs have have issued or wanted to issue. No, I'm I'm not hearing anything about their stable coins. No, no, no. Only ours. Or or those of um the, those of uh, Facebook. I, I find it really really odd. Really really selective. Continuing on, due to their potential, potentially large size and reach, GSCs could additionally pose challenges to fair competition. No, they can't. Financial stability, monetary policy, and in the extreme, the international monetary system. Yeah, that's too late. They may also impact safety and efficiency of the overall payment system. These challenges stem in part from the fact that GSCs may transform from a cross-border payment solution to assets with money-like features. At their meeting in Chantilly in July 2019, G7 finance ministers and central bank governors agreed that stablecoins, in particular projects with global and potentially systemic footprints, raise serious regulatory and systemic concerns. Furthermore, 
Ministers and governors agreed that possible stablecoin initiatives and their operators must meet the highest standards and be subject to prudent supervision and oversight, and that possible regulatory gaps should, as a matter of policy, be assessed and addressed. The G7 finance ministers and central bank governors asked for a report from the Working Group on Stablecoins, including its recommendations, by the time of the IMF World Bank annual meetings in October of 2019. This report reflects the discussions of the Working Group. The G7 believes that no global stablecoin project should begin, begin operation until the legal, regulatory, and oversight challenges and risks outlined above are adequately addressed, though appropriate designs uh, through appropriate designs and by adhering to regulation that is clear and proportional. That said, depending on the unique design and details of each stablecoin arrangement, approval may be contingent on additional regulatory requirements and adherence to core pub public pub policy goals. Yeah, whatever. You don't get to tell us that shit. This report is organized as follows. Section 1 provides an overview of the stablecoin ecosystem and the need to improve payment systems and services. Section 2 details the regulatory, oversight, and policy issues associated with stablecoin initiatives, highlighting the particular challenges inherent in GSCs. Section 3 provides a preliminary review of existing regulatory and oversight regimes that may be applicable to stablecoins. Section 4 sets out the way forward, including improvements to cross-border payments. Stablecoin arrangements are complex ecosystems that can dif differ markedly for, according to their design. Stablecoins generally function within a broader ecosystem, delivering the following core functions. Issuance, redemption, and stabilization of the value of the coins. Oh, I'm sorry, that was A. B. Transfer of the coins among users. C. Interaction with the users. Each function generally involves some operational entities, such as a governing body exchange, a governing body, exchanges, wallet providers, and payment system operators, and core technology infrastructure, such as distributed ledger technology and smart contracts. In addition, standards could be imposed by by the central governance entity or through automated technology protocols. See Annex A for more detailed description of the stablecoin ecosystem. The value of a stablecoin is typically related to an asset or portfolio of underlying assets. However, stablecoin designs differ markedly according to their exchange rate policy with respect to a sovereign currency, fixed or variable. The nature of the claim user the, the nature of the claim users have, the redemption pr pledge offered by the stablecoin providers, and the type of assets used. At least three design models have emerged. In the first, the stablecoin is issued with a face value expressed in a commonly used unit of account. Users have a direct claim on the issuer or underlying assets, and the provider pledges to redeem coins at par in the same currency that was used to purchase the coins. Assets in this model are typically liquid. Are, are typically liquid. In the second model, the stablecoin is not issued with a specified face value, but con constituent, but constitutes a share. Of, of a portfolio of underlying assets, much like an exchange traded fund. In the third model, the coin is backed by a claim against the issuer. The coin's value is rooted in the public's trust in the issuing institution, and where relevant, those who regulate it. 1.2 Improving Payment Systems and Services 
Stablecoin initiatives have highlighted shortcomings in cross-border payments and access to transaction accounts. Depending on their design, stablecoin arrangements may increase the efficiency of, of payments provided they are interoperable and benefit from a level playing field. Domestic payments, in most instances, are increasingly convenient, instantaneous, and available 24-7. Cross-border payments, however, remain slow, expensive, and opaque, especially for retail payments such as remittances. Box 1 describes the current challenges in, the cross -border pay in cross border payments. Recent stablecoin initiatives have highlighted these shortcomings and emphasized the importance of improving the access to traditional financial services and cross border retail payments. In principle, retail stablecoins could enable a wide range of payments and serve as a gateway to other financial services. In doing so, they could replace the role of transaction accounts, which are a stepping stone to broader financial inclusion. Stablecoin initiatives also have the potential to increase competition by challenging market dominance of incumbent financial institutions. That's exactly what they're doing. However, the positive impact on competition is predicated on there being a level playing field and interoperability of systems to avoid introducing new barriers to entry. However, for stablecoins to meet the needs of the unbanked and underserved, they must first prove to be a safe store of value, ensure high values of protection and legal certainty for their users, and be compliant with relevant regulations. Furthermore, they would have to overcome the barriers that currently restrict access to and the use of transaction accounts. And you know what, we're, we're going to go ahead and pause it right there and throw back down into some music, but we'll, when we come back, we'll be on uh, page 10 of 37. So it's, it's going pretty damn quick. Yeah, I don't think that uh, these people really understand what they're talking about. You know, because stablecoins, like I said, they're, they're based on public cryptocurrency blockchains, i.e. they're dependent upon these volatile, uh, unreliable cryptocurrencies that they were talking down just a moment ago. Anyway, so if, as far as where we're going to go, let's go with a little bit of Red Fang, Blood Like Cream, here on Coin Metal. And that was Exodus with Cajun Hell. Yeah, hello, that guy. That guy, that guy in uh, Telegram. Give me a little reply there. Looks like uh, Rob Zombie, maybe? I don't know, I can't tell. Anywho, uh, let's get back into this this paper here. I, I don't know how much of it, how much more of it we're gonna do, only because the, these guys are talking in a context that would make sense like ten years ago. You know, if they were to be talking about a uh, alternative currency to the U.S. dollar or other fiat currencies, um, were were it to like spontaneously explode into the into the world, you know that that's the kind of context that they're putting on this, and it's like, look, we're here after a decade. The only reason you're talking about us is because we've been running this shit for a decade. <laughs> so anyway, continuing on, challenges in cross border payments. A number of cost factors and other challenges influence the provision of cross-border retail payments. These cost factors include correspondent banking fees, FX costs, telecommunication costs, scheme fees, and interchange fees. Additionally, legal, regulatory, and compliance costs are perceived as being significantly higher than for domestic retail payments. AML slash CFTC, CFT and sanction compliance are critical to maintaining financial integrity and protecting the global financial system from abuse by money launderers, terrorists, and other bad actors. <clears throat> However, 
they may thereby add significant costs to cross-border payments, especially if there are differences in rules or requirements across the jurisdictions involved and if the required preventative measures, customer due diligence, sanction screening, etc., are completed multiple times at different steps in the transaction chain. Dude, that that's exactly why your shit is less efficient than us. You, that's why you need three to five business days to do all this bullshit. We get that shit done in ten minutes. We do not need you. Continuing on. <clears throat> While it is important that rules accommodate differences among jurisdictions apportionately, greater harmonization of these detailed requirements and improved international cooperation and information sharing could help reduce this pain point. <laughs> this is fucking hilarious. You know, it's you know what's hilarious about this is that. The, the legacy finance system is set up the way it is specifically so there are jurisdictions where one can take advantage of arbitrage between regulatory oversight and regulatory friction. That's the whole point. You know, these people talking about harmonization and standardization, they're talking about eliminating those advantages or disadvantages in putting money in any specific place. Anyway, continuing on. While not specific to cross-border payments, money laundering and financing of terrorism risks are typically considered to be higher in the cross-border context since more complexities are involved. <clears throat> Additionally, payment service providers, PSPs, may struggle to interoperate due to lack of standardization. Standardization and interoperability are important catalysts to the quest to increase efficiency and realize economies of scale and network effects in cross-border retail payments. Some initiatives, such as the development of ISO 2022, Benefits cannot be reaped if they are interpreted and implemented differently across jurisdictions. Just as PSPs may struggle to interoperate due to lack of standardization of messaging formats, back-end service providers may struggle to print, transmit and reconcile transactions for the same reason. Yeah, that's why we're just going to ignore you. If I can conduct a transaction over IRC, that, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid all of your your operational difficulties. Continuing, messaging can give rise to challenges for cross-border retail payments if the information originated by the payer's PSP does not tally in content or format with the information required by the payee's PSP. Why do I need a fucking PSP? I can just do P to P and avoid the PSP all in, entirely. And not worry about the payee or the, the payer or the... Yeah, fuck you. The need to conduct foreign exchange transactions adds complexity and risk for PSPs and back-end service providers. These additional complexities need to be managed and the risks mitigated, which can increase costs in ways that are neither, neither transparent nor predictable and reduce the speed of an overall transaction. Another factor that poses challenges to the fast and efficient processing of cross-border retail payments is the different time zones and resulting diverging opening hours of payment systems around the world. Yeah, we don't have to worry about that shit with cryptocurrencies. Uh, yeah, we, we, we don't need them to be open. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Back to the barter system. Goods for crypto. Fucking A, man. And really, you know, realistically, that is the most efficient use of cryptocurrencies or any currency is straight up fucking retail, man. You know, it's like say say I uh, designed something in in uh, in CAD or whatever to be printed out, in, you know, a three D printer printed out thing, right? And I sell a copy to you for like you know fifty cents. You know, I don't give a fuck that you know I just 
sold you the design for an engine that you're going to print out in your, your living room or whatever. I don't care about that. I just care about the 50 cents. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. Uh, let's see. The, the need to conduct foreign exchange transactions adds complexity and risks. Yeah, we already covered that. A major obstacle to the interlinking of domestic payment systems and or the development of shared global payment platforms is differing legal frameworks across jurisdictions and the associated uncertainty about the enforceability of contractual obligations resulting from participation in interlinked or shared payment platforms operating across borders. Yeah, we, we take care of that the old-fashioned way. Either the shit works and the other parties follow through on their obligations or we don't continue to do business or use that particular software. That's, that's how we've done it for the last 10 years. And these people think they're going to replace that whole process with some sort of regulatory framework and they're going to snap their fingers and wave a magic wand and the shit's just going to work. And it's not going to happen that way. It hasn't worked that way for us. <laughs> why, why the fuck would they expect it to work that way for them? <laughs> you know, suddenly the 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 uh, international bank, the Bank of International Settlements, you know, their stamp or a seal of approval or their their you know s- sign off that they were involved in it that that suddenly just makes the protocols work and makes the fucking transaction goes through and makes the the double spends not happen and give me a fucking break, give me a break. Ah, continuing. Improving domestic payments infrastructure can remove many of the pain points that users and businesses currently experience. Still, significant challenges will remain that make the cross-border payments costlier, slower, and less transparent. Yeah, go fuck yourself. We just use public blockchains and we do it way faster than you and we just get the shit done. Many public sector projects are attempting to ease some of these pay points to make international payments as seamless as domestic. Actually, they're far more seamless than domestic. That's the whole point of them. The primary goals of the official sector projects tend to focus on improving efficiency and interoperability, enriching data, expanding functionality, increasing operating hours and access, and introducing a faster real-time retail payments rail. For example, the use of the legal entity identifier, LEI, aids in quickly identifying parties in a transaction and reducing AML CFT compliance costs. Yeah, in other words, they just got a little number associated with them in a database and it comes up and they don't have to keep saying, we are cool, you know, we're cool, We're, we're, we're regulated, we're licensed. Continuing. Two, Challenges and risks for public policy oversight and regulation. 1. Stablecoins pose a number of challenges and risks to public policy objectives and the supporting regulatory and oversight frameworks. Yeah, they can't control the shit. 2. Public authorities expect stablecoin developers to adopt the highest standards to address risks before their arrangements are operational. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't work that way. The shit either works or it doesn't, and as soon as it does work, it goes out of beta into operational. Stablecoins introduce a host of potential challenges and risks from a public policy, oversight, and regulatory perspective. No, it doesn't. You you fucking people, you you are ignoring stablecoins in the one place that you really should be monitoring them and fucking with them. And you're trying to use them as some sort of, you know, uh, unit that they can point to and say, oh, all all cryptocurrencies are going to have to, you know, comply with this standard. And and, and it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Public authorities expect stablecoin developers, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, the shit either works or it doesn't. Stablecoins introduced a hope, a host of potential challenges and risks from a public policy, oversight, and regulatory perspective. A fundamental challenge is that stablecoin arrangements are not all the same, and the opportunities and risks they present depend on the structure and design underlying each stablecoin arrangement. That said, there are some commonalities among them. 
Some of the risks, for example, regarding the safety and efficiency of payment systems, money laundering, and terrorist financing, consumers slash investor protection and data protection are familiar and can be addressed, at least partially, within existing regulatory, supervisory, and oversight frameworks. However, their implementation and enforcement may involve additional complexity given the nature of certain stablecoins. Stablecoin arrangements are expected to meet the same criteria and abide by the same robust requirements as traditional payment systems, payment schemes, or providers of payment services. Yeah, bullshit. I.e. the same activities, same risks, same regulations. Yeah, you, you don't do that. In order to ensure that they are appropriately designed and operate safely and effectively, in accordance with public policy objectives. Additionally, some of the economic characteristics of stablecoin arrangements resemble conventional activities conducted by payment systems, ETFs, money market funds, and banks, which could be useful to understanding <coughs> possible risk of, sta of stablecoin functions. Public authorities expect stablecoin developers to address such risks before their projects are operational. Yeah, whatever. Stablecoin arrangements may also pose risks that fall outside existing legal or regulatory frameworks. Stablecoins may combine new technology, new entrance to financial services, and new financial offerings. Retail stablecoins, given their public nature, likely use for likely use for high volume small value payments and potentially high adoption rate may give rise to different risks than wholesale stable coins <clears throat> available to a restricted group of users. Policymakers recognize their responsibility to adjust existing rules and exist new regulation where needed. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you say. None of that shit matters anymore. If, if I set up some sort of arrangement with Goldman Sachs and we decide to circulate between us our own stable coin, you know, and, and we transact with one another and a select number of entities in this this particular stable coin. That that's among us. And, and really, this is this is probably the greater infection point. And in, uh, I say I said that intentionally. Infection point where regulators and central bankers are going to learn the hard way what they're stand what what trying to enforce their their um, ideological or political aims via their monetary unit um, what what kind of reward that's going to uh, going to deliver now that we're capable of wielding that that vorpal blade of digital finance the way that they have you know we, we talk about the same thing on, on this show about um, shit like like um, warfare uh, cyber warfare you know using uh, using glitches in exploits to harm other countries and you know doing so on a national ba or a, a government basis you know a government acting against another government or even the use of drones, you know, by by the United States, you know, because we were the first to really deploy and utilize them in at the scale that we have, that we've set the the tenor for for that that game, you know, we we've set the rules for that kind of game, and that you know that includes shit like raining down Hellfire missiles on neighborhoods and shit. You know, because that's what we did. You know, so utilizing monetary units and monetary policy of one country to harm other countries via sanctions and embargoes and other such restrictions, it set the rules for monetary warfare. And Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies opened that warfare to the average individual. 
you know the average individual is effectively now has has access to the big red button you know the one that launches all the all the nuclear missiles and shit yeah that's economically that's what's happened you know the, these people are still talking like there's some sort of order that they're going to be able to maintain over the longer term and given the reality that I've just laid out that that time is gone that that time ended about like I want to see reasonably it was 2011 2012 you know because by then the a, a greater number of the entities that that had put their toe into the water of cryptocurrency were rewarded with the knowledge that their sh- the shit worked <laughs> and, and just as good as any any uh, bank's monetary transfer or, or facilitated monetary transfer that they'd ever performed <clears throat> anyway let's get back into this thing stable coins offered by large existing platforms such as big techs could scale rapidly due to their established global customer bases and links to platforms that offer an easily accessible uh, interface. Such arrangements that have the potential to become global pose risks beyond those of small-scale stablecoin arrangements and therefore uh, present additional public policy challenges, including those to the safety and efficiency of the overall payment system competition policy, financial stability, monetary policy transmission, and longer-term implications for the international monetary system. Yeah, that, that's, that's all said and done. It's, it's done. 2.1. Legal, regulatory, oversight, and public policy issues regardless of scale. 2.1.1. Legal certainty. A well-founded, clear, and transparent legal basis in all relevant jurisdictions is a prerequisite for any stablecoin arrangement. Yeah, that's not free to define. You can go fuck off. Having a well-founded, clear, and transparent legal basis is a core element of payment, clearing, and settlement arrangements. A stablecoin must be underpinned by clear legal terms that define and govern with certainty and predictability material aspects of how the underlying technical arrangements are utilized by parties. However, stable coins in the underlying technical and contractual arrangements may vary significantly, and the applicable legal regime depends crucially on the particular design and characterization. Ambiguous rights and obligations could make the stablecoin arrangement vulnerable to a loss of confidence with implications for financial stability. <clears throat> Users must be given confidence that stablecoins will in practice be as stable as advertised. If value stabilization relies on market mechanisms, then legal obligations of market makers must be defined so as to ensure liquidity at all times to all customers. As and again, that, that's not for you to define. You know, again, the the shit will either work or it won't work, and when it doesn't work, everybody will lose confidence in it, and that and that's a natural fucking product. Of the market at work. You know, and these people want to address that like it's something wrong. No, it's not something wrong. You know, the the deer is born, the deer matures, the deer dies. You know, whether it was fortunate enough to propagate in between, that depends solely on the deer. Hmm. Continuing on. As regards the legal characterization of stablecoins, the most relevant determinative factors are whether or not they are considered as a money equivalent, categorized as contractual claims or property rights, or entail a right against an issuer or against an under underlying assets. In some jurisdictions, stablecoins may constitute a security or financial instrument, such as a deb- debt instrument or represent an interest in a fund or collective investment vehicle and be subject to applicable laws relating to securities and financial instruments. 
Particular issues may, may arise in a cross-jurisdictional context as there is a need to determine which jurisdiction's law applies to individual elements in the overall design and which jurisdiction's courts have comp competency to settle disputes. There is also a potential for conflicts of law given the different treatments in different jurisdictions. The applicable financial sector law in certain jurisdictions may not be keeping pace with new business models and market activities such as stablecoins. A number of recent initiatives by national authorities are seeking to address this uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> Where an arrangement relies on DLT to record or transfer monetary value, careful consideration must be given to the legal underpinning of such an arrangement, which must be at least as robust as traditional systems. For example, the legal basis regarding the rights and obligations of the relevant parties and settlement finality must always be clear. 2.1.2 Sound governance. Sound governance must be clearly established prior to live operations. Yeah, whatever. Sound and efficient governance promotes the safety and efficiency of payments and related services. The governance structure of the arrangement must also be clearly defined and conveyed to all ecosystem participants. <clears throat> Good governance can also be it can also support the stability of the broader financial system as well as other relevant public interest considerations. Ergo, by enhancing decision-making pertaining to the arrangement's design or through the involvement of a broad spectrum of stakeholders. Arrangements that rely on intermediaries and third-party providers should be in a position to review and control the risks they bear, from, they bear from and pose to other entities. <laughs> yeah, whatever. This could be particularly important if the arrangement involves a variety of entities with specialized tasks and responsibilities, not necessarily <clears throat> falling within the regulatory parameter. Perimeter, rather. These entities may still depend on each other, and some of them are likely to be interconnected with the overall financial system. Yeah, whatever. Where DLT is used in the arrangement, lines of responsibility and accountability, as well as recovery procedures, need to be carefully calibrated. Sound governance may be especially challenging in the case of permissionless DLT systems. A decentralized system with no responsible entity may be unable to fulfill regulatory and oversight requirements. Dude, by that line right there, not a single fucking one of them can. There, there isn't any that, that can. Because at some point or another, they're all interconnected with Bitcoin or Ethereum or some other publicly mined currency. If they're not, then, then I don't think in any sense they really are a quote-unquote cryptocurrency at all. Anyway, continuing on. I, I don't know. I think there's like one or two that are, that are supposedly associated with some DPoS bullshit. But again, that's DPoS. Delegated proof of stake. That means there are fiducias that are picked. Not their identities aren't even necessarily known, but there are fiducias out there that are picked, and they act as fiduciaries over the the status of the funds and the status of the transactions that are happening on the network and in that coin. So, you know, in that sense, I mean, I, I would really like to sit in a room and talk with these guys, but they would have to pay me a significant sum of money to actually endure their bullshit. Because to me, I, I'm like seeing a lot of like what seem to be conceptual failures on the part of these entities where they simply don't understand what the fuck they're talking about. Anyway, continuing on. 
On the other hand, a highly complex governance structure could hamper the decision making on the arrangement's design and technological evolution, or could slow down incident responses related to operational issues. Yeah, we, we, every single cryptocurrency in the world experiences this. If they didn't, Ethereum would have been proof of stake two years ago. If the reserve assets are not segregated from the equity of the stablecoin issuer, then the investment policy could be misused to privatize returns from the assets, whereas losses of the assets would be socialized to the coin holders. Yeah, that's what we experience in the exchange rate between Tether and fucking USDC and GUSD DC and Bitcoin. Continuing on. <clears throat> Financial Integrity, AML slash CFT. Public authorities will apply the highest international standards relating to virtual assets and their providers with regard to AML slash CFT. No, you won't. Number two, the G7 will lead by example to swiftly and effectively implement and amend FATF standards relating to virtual assets. No, no, it won't. If not effectively regulated and supervised, crypto assets including stablecoins can pose significant risks to financial integrity and may create new opportunities for money laundering, terrorist financing, or other illicit financing activities. That, that's what they're meant for. What the fuck are you talking about? To mitigate these risks, providers of stablecoins and other entities that are part of a stablecoin ecosystem should comply with the highest international standards for AML, CFT, CFT and countering the financing of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, CPF. The possibility of peer-to-peer -peer transactions in some stablecoin arrangements is an additional risk that should be considered. <laughs> yeah, that, that possibility is well out of your hands. You can get, o get over that one. The FATF is the International Standard Setting Body for AML CFT CPF. The FATF provides a robust and comprehensive framework to combat money laundering, terrorist financing, financing proliferation, and other illicit finance for countries, financial institutions, and designated non-financial businesses and professions. While recognizing the importance of responsible innovation, the FATF is also committed to ensuring that its standards are in line with emerging risks. No, they aren't. In October 2018, the FATF adopted changes to its recommendations to clarify that they apply to financial activities involving virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. Yeah, no, 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 no. You think they do. They don't. The changes were supplemented with an imperative note and update, updated guidance in June of 2019. It is of vital importance that the international standard setters, including the FATF, continue to engage with market participants to stay apprised of developments and stay ready, stand ready to review their recommendations to ensure that all illicit financing risks are appropriately mitigated. The G7 supports the FATF framework, I'm sure they do, as well as the FATF's ongoing review of countries' implementation of the FATF standards and its continuous efforts to ensure that the FATF standards require countries and financial institutions to understand and mitigate the risks associated with new technologies, including new financial products or services that they don't actually fucking control or have any control of. Additional work may be needed to further clarify the extent to which the various activities within stablecoin ecosystems are covered by regulatory requirements. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't think these people pay attention to anything going on, and I I really don't. Two point one point four safety efficiency and integrity of payment systems, and we're just gonna finish this page, and then we're gonna break into some music here. Effective regulation and oversight of stablecoin arrangements is critical to achieve the public policy goals of payment system safety and efficiency. 
Number two, regulatory and policy frameworks are expected to remain technologically neutral and not hinder innovation <laughs> while ensuring that it is safe and robust. Yeah, not hinder innovation. We're just going to put all the regulatory craft and friction that you came to cryptocurrencies to escape on cryptocurrencies and expect that it's going to stay as fast and efficient and that you'll be as willing to comply. And yeah, whatever. The smooth functioning of payment systems is vital to the financial system and the wider economy. Individuals and firms need accessible and cost-effective means of payment. The system facilitates commercial activities and fosters economic growth, thereby benefiting society as a whole. Okay, and, and that's right there, fosters economic growth. If I create a cryptocurrency that fosters economic growth between private citizens who happen to live separately in different jurisdictions and different regulatory regimes and different sanction statuses. Who, who are these people to, to intrude or set the standards for that commerce? And more importantly, if it's fostering economic growth, it would be benefiting society as a whole, despite the fact it's unregulated, and despite the fact that it could be categorized as money laundering, and it could be categorized as financing terrorism, because somebody out there could legally define facilitating the breath or... Um, Thoughts, uh, thir thirst exhaustion or, or rest or, or food to somebody who had been legally defined as a terrorist by some other entity unbeknownst to them it could be defined as some sort of terror you know I am financing terrorism activity and if, fuck you that I mean to me you know they, they bitch about like vagueness, regulatory vagueness, and whatnot. This this is exactly what I'm talking about, or or what they are talking about. You know, they create it. They create it in their definitions. They create it by by putting shit in there, like the fat f f a t f, right? The financial actions task force network, or some shit like that. I, I forgot the 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 thing it actually stands for. But, you know, they, they put in all these words, DLT. What the fuck is DLT? When I read the, the Bitcoin white paper, there, there's nothing in there about distributed ledger technology. There's nothing about DLT. BDLT. I mean, come on now. DLT, as far as I'm concerned, does not... Uh, anything you could say about it doesn't actually apply to a cryptocurrency. But according to them, you know, there's a DLT system. A permissionless DLT system is a decentralized system with no responsible entity, maybe unable to, f with no responsible entity. Okay, so that that's not true. I mean, I, I, not of anything that I know of. A, a cryptocurrency could be defined as a decentralized system if, in fact, its network is composed of public miners, you know, individuals out in the public, private individuals who decided to dedicate some hardware, electricity, and bandwidth to the process of mining a cryptocurrency. The, those entities are not not responsible. They are at will. There's a difference. You know, the I think they've come to terms with the fact that they can't really stop any of this shit. And so they're basically, they're trying to redefine it by putting different decorations on it and calling it by a different name, despite the fact that it is dependent still upon individuals just like you. See, I think that they intend to do it in this way where... They change the decorations on the outside of it, so they stamp, they stick a stable coin such as USDT on top of it. 
right? Or or Fed coin, you know, the Federal Reserve makes their own coin or some central bank makes their own coin and they put it on top of the Bitcoin network and then they make some sort of requirements for those who, who are participating in mining it. Because, hey, man, you know, we, we can't have you fucking up with your hardware and, and, and fucking up our network and fucking up fucking USA coin. And, and what's that going to do? In my mind, if that if that becomes the function of Bitcoin, where it's just a quote unquote blockchain that that some private entities are, are mining, what use is it to anybody else? Nothing. And I, I believe that the miners aren't going to go away. They're just going to go to other coins. They're going to go to Bitcoin Cash. They're going to go to BSV. They're going to go to Verge. They're going to go to Litecoin, Monero, or one of the thousand other fucking coins out there and, and start over. And all of this regulatory oversight requirements and all the, the fucking safety requirements, all, all that other bullshit, go fly out the fucking window. <clears throat> Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music before we close up for the evening. Just a short one here. And, uh, yeah, a little bit of faith no more for you. Epic. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Gizmachi with Burn. And so, yeah, as we're rounding out this episode, you know, I'm, I'm left to wonder exactly what it is there, there's going to be a catalyst I'm not exactly sure what it is but I'm pretty sure it's going to involve stable coins and the kind of um, liquidity crisis that they're that this this paper that we were reviewing today is actually talking about and there's going to be an attempt to use that as a reason why we have to establish an international regulatory framework and make everything work and, and, and basically make public cryptocurrencies illegal. It will fail. For one, it's going to fail to take out the people that are circulating U.S. dollars People who are circulating U.S. dollars and have a lot of U.S. dollars on hand are going to weather the storm just fine. People who are holding cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin and other independently mined cryptocurrencies, are going to weather the storm just fine. Their networks are going to be just fine, and the kerfuffle, once it's blown through, will either be rolled back on their networks or simply disregarded and will continue to mine on into the future but I don't see this idea of a single monetary unit or a single regulatory standard being established because again nations enjoy their regulatory status they enjoy having their regulatory reign and they can they can deal with the shit however they want to within their national borders and abroad with their international partners however this order is vastly changing and the equivalent would be something to the effect of insisting that everybody continue to walk in an age when they could simply go to their garage and cobble together out of daily er, everyday use items a vehicle capable of flying them from point A to point B you, you can see here where 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 the issue is you know that you have technological capability to build a flying vehicle but no we demand that you continue to walk. Now, we can't stop you from building a flying vehicle, nor can we stop you from flying it if, in fact, you were to design one that could actually get off the ground. But we're going to insist that you continue to walk. Now, imagine that, except 
there's no threat of you crashing with the exception of maybe your your computer crashing or failing on you or the others the other participants in the coin simply forking you out of it but that means that you also have to be a faithful participant you have to act in good faith you have to fulfill on your obligations You don't necessarily have to be worth what everybody said you were worth when we first made the transaction. That's up to me to assume the the threat of the possibility that the coin that we're transacting in is going to devalue some point between when you give it to me and I have the opportunity to exchange it for something else. But it's there's not a regulatory body on this planet, nor will there ever be, that will be able to guarantee to me that when I spend that money, the units that I'm spending it in are going to be worth on face or in the market what they were when I received them from somebody else. They're either going to be worth more or they're going to be worth less. But again, there isn't a regulatory entity on this planet, nor will there ever be, that will be able to define that for me. That that will be dependent, as it always has been and always will be, upon the market and how it values your coins or the coins that we're transacting in. And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. Uh, we will be back again on Monday, although we might be might be absent on Wednesday. I, I may be taking that night off for a specific event that may or may not happen. We'll find out. Anyway, I'll let you guys know on Monday, but we will be back again on Monday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe, do your homework, and watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else can do it for you, not even the fat F. And as far as our last dance is concerned, we're going to go ahead and throw it down with some prong, compulsive future projection. Last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent weekend. Good night.